Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. I'm delighted tonight to be with two really important scholars to celebrate an event we're calling Black Feminist Interventions. So this conversation is between Hazel V. Carvey and Catherine McKittrick. Hazel V. Carby is the Charles C. and Dorothea S. Dilley Professor Emeritus of African American Studies and Professor Emeritus of American Studies at Yale University and a Fellow of the Royal Society for the Arts, as well as an Honorary Fellow of the Learning Society of Wales. She is currently a visiting research professor and, professor and humanities institute faculty at Dartmouth College. Imperial Intimacies, A Tale of Two Islands is the book that we are celebrating tonight with her. It was selected as one of the books of the year for 2019 by the Times Literary Supplement, and it has just been published in the United States by Verso Books. So welcome, Professor Carby. And we are joined as well by Professor Catherine Kittrick, who is Professor of Black Studies and Gender Studies at Queen's University. She authored Demonic Grounds, Black Women and the Cartographies of Struggle, edited Sylvia Winter on Being Human as Praxis, and co-edited with Clyde Woods, Black Geographies and the Politics of Place. Her most recent monograph, Dear Science and Other Stories, is an exploration of Black methodologies and is the book we are celebrating this evening. So I want to welcome both of you and also welcome our co-host for this evening, which is the Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American Culture and History. Librarian Morris Gardner is in the chat with us dropping uh, supplemental materials. So for folks who are watching at home, just know those links will stay up. You don't have to rush and open them all at once, they will stay. You can go back and enrich your knowledge after the conversation. So keep your attention with our conversants and just know that that rich bounty is gonna be waiting for you in the chat when we wrap up. Um, finally, uh, we may have time for some questions. So if you have a burning question that you uh, want to present to our conversation, uh, partners, you can do that by clicking the ask a question button at the bottom center of your screen. But mostly we're just going to be focusing on this wonderful conversation. So thank you both so much for being here. It's truly an honor uh, and a pleasure to have you with us tonight. Thank you, ER. And hello, everybody. Hazel and I have decided that we will um, read from our books about 15 minutes or so each. And then we are going to have an open conversation about some of the ideas that um, we can think about across both books and what we liked about each other's books. And hopefully if we have time, we'll have a, a few minutes for Q&A. So I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Hazel Carby and she will read from Imperial Intimacies. So good evening, everybody. <clears throat> um, I'm going to read a little bit from the introduction, uh, just to give you a, a sense of, of the whole book. And then I've decided to frame it with um, two of the characters. Um, one is um, my father, and the other is um, the person who turned out to be the slaveholder of the Carbys um, in Jamaica. So, I should also just apologize for a scratchy voice. I have a cold, so please be patient. <clears throat> Imperial Intimacies is a story of the everyday ties, relations, and intricate independencies of empire and colonialism. It does not conform to the way in which most stories of empire have been told, and it questions what we think we know about our shared colonial past. I incorporate stories of my Welsh mother, my Jamaican father and their ancestors into material drawn from colonial archives and histories to show how my mother and father were shaped by the places and the times in which they lived. But family stories and historical accounts sit uneasily side by side. When I assembled the various pieces, I found that rather than cohere 
into a unified narrative. Their juxtaposition revealed the shards of conflict and contradiction that familial, national and imperial ideologies work to conceal. I used family memories as a guide to navigate material in the National Archives of Jamaica and the UK. But when I stumbled, I had to put aside the voices of my relatives because they hindered my ability to see what they had disguised, hidden, or had absolutely no intention of passing on. So Imperial Intimacies is an account written from the perspective of someone of Jamaican Welsh ancestry, who does not take for granted definitions of being British, but rather is interested in how subjects become British and how people are inscribed into ideologies of empire and into beliefs of whiteness that enable them to feel superior, even when desperately poor. The story of imperial relations is as restless as the Atlantic, surging between the islands of Britain and Jamaica, as I follow currents that draw me back into the 18th century. But the book is also anchored temporarily in the particular places in which my family lived and died. The urban centres of London, Bath, Bristol, Cardiff and Kingston and the rural landscapes of Devon, Somerset, Lincolnshire and Portland. It is not an exceptional story about becoming British, but asserts that Britishness harbours the deepest interconnections of class and race and gender. Trying to find your way as the white mother of a black child, trying to survive as a black child in a colony and a black man in the metropole. Being a girl regarded as an oxymoron when she claimed she was both black and British. So to the girl. <coughs> On the 22nd of June, 1948, 492 passengers from Jamaica carrying British passports, disembarked at Tilbury with the intention of being part of the labor force which was needed to rebuild the devastated metropolitan heart of empire. Most of the passengers on the boat, the Empire Windrush, were returning servicemen, many of them RAF, former RAF personnel but their service to Britain during the war was quickly forgotten and their claims to being as British as anyone else were denied. Outside of my immediate family, it seemed as if the ship, the Empire Windrush, was remembered only as the first of many ships that carried racial problems into the country. My father, a flight sergeant in the RAF was sent to Jamaica to escort servicemen returning from leave on one of those ships. And he was considered one of those problems. As were his two children and his wife, who in addition to being a traitor to her race, must be a slut because no respectable white woman would associate with, let alone marry, a Jamaican. Anti-immigrant sentiment flourished as I grew from infant to teenager and in the increasingly antagonistic atmosphere evocations of the wind rush became a burden to bear. It was as if 
the ship represented some sort of cultural and political break in time. A mythological system of beliefs developed, marking a before and after in British history. Before the Windrush, Britain was white. Black bodies contaminated traditional British values. The heartbeat of the nation was regulated by the rhythms of fair play until black people arrived from the colonies and the cancerous traces of race and racism appeared in the nation's bloodstream. Before boatloads of ungrateful immigrants landed and taxed the natural tolerance of its domestic citizens to unacceptable limits, the British Empire had been a benevolent force for good in its colonies. In short, the Windrush symbolized the beginning of the end of empire and Britain's demise from the status of being a great power. At school, the girls suffered the consequences of this historical amnesia. When the boy who sat at the desk to her right, the one who used to pinch her arm whenever the teacher's back was turned, when he had finished talking about heat and flies and deserts and driving tanks across Egypt, he looked at her smugly as if to say, beat that. It was her turn to describe her father's contribution to the war effort. She stood and stated clearly that her father served in the RAF. On the piano at home stood a photograph of a young man in an RAF uniform with an enigmatic smile, head tilted at a slightly rakish and daredevil angle, holding a pipe in his hand. In the eyes of his daughter, her father was the epitome of wartime British heroism. Before the girl could describe the photograph to her classmates, she was abruptly interrupted by the teacher. In a loud, sharp voice, she was told to sit back down and listen carefully. She sat. The entire class was stunned. Silenced by their teacher's angry glare, they stared at the girl who cowered in shock and humiliation as the teacher warned her about the dire consequences of telling lies and insisted that there were no coloured people in Britain during the war, that no coloured people served in any of the armed services and certainly not in the RAF, the most elite branch of the British military. The eyes of the teacher swept like searchlights over the class, scanning the rows of desks behind which the children sat rigid. There was nowhere to hide. Speaking in the slow and deliberate tone of voice that she adopted when she would brook no opposition, the teacher declared that coloured people were not British, but immigrants who arrived on these shores after the war had been fought and won. All the children shifted back in their seats. This was the girl's formal introduction to British history as taught in the 1950s at her primary school. She had previously absorbed the fact that she was a nigger, a wog and half caste. And now she learned that she was not considered British. So at the other end of the book, we are into the 18th century from the 1940s. The book actually travels back in time. And it's funny really, because the sections I've decided to read both concern men, but actually most of the book is actually about women, but anyway. So this is where we end up back in Jamaica after having found um, the slave registers in the National Archives of, at Kew 
And uh, in addition to listing all the enslaved, there was the name of the slave owner. And I went back to the archives and it took a long time, but I found who he was. <clears throat> Lily Carby washed up on Jamaica's shores in 1788 as a soldier with the 1st Battalion, 10th Foot Lincolnshire Regiment of the British Army. He landed in Kingston ill and disoriented from a six-week transatlantic voyage. <clears throat> Much has been written about how the scenes and sense of tropical ecology were like an Eden and that they overpowered new arrivals as they tottered ashore in Jamaica. But Lily's senses were first assailed by the pestilential stench of death and decay that emanated from the guinea ships in the harbour. Soldiers disembarked weak from vomiting and diarrhoea caused by spoilt food and beer, as well as being unsteady on their feet from the incessant churning of the ocean. In intense heat, they assembled in columns wearing flannel shirts and wool-lined uniforms before being marched either to the crowded, filthy conditions of the fort at Port Royal on the aptly named Mosquito Point or to other coastal or hill barracks on the island. As soon as he disembarked in Port Royal, Lily would have encountered Aedes aegypti, the mosquito carrying malaria and yellow fever, diseases to which the newly arrived troops were particularly vulnerable. When he fell ill with a fever, Lily would have been told by the more experienced soldiers to seek care from Jamaican women of colour, whose nursing skills were considered far superior to those of the military doctors, whose treatment was usually fatal. The British army was garrisoned in Jamaica, as in other islands of the West Indies, to protect trade, prevent invasion, and most importantly, to suppress rebellions of the enslaved on the plantations. Soldiers were barracked in different kinds of military installations around the coast and in the hills. The West Indies was regarded as the death trap of the British army. Between 1793 and 1801, 89,000 soldiers served in the West Indies and more than half of them died there. If discharges and desertions are included, the losses rise to 70%. Confinement in the pestilential, infested, overcrowded conditions of the West India barracks amid such a high rate of mortality had a profound effect on soldiers. And desertion was an option that hundreds chose, even though it was a serious offence punishable by death. But few deserters were ever found. Everyone knew that the higher the elevation, the healthier the climate. So when Lily found himself barracked at Fort George in Port Antonio on the north coast, he deserted into the mountains. And he was rapidly absorbed into Jamaica's plantation order. <clears throat> the road I travelled climbed gradually, then steeply, toward the junction of the Swift River and its tributary, the Black River, where, in the 18th and 19th century, Lily Carby held 14 people enslaved on a coffee settlement in Portland until the emancipation of 1834-38, to 38, after which the supposedly emancipated, found that they were still not free. The road had been hewn from pathways trodden for centuries. It traced the contours of the landscape, doggedly clinging to slopes when the land dropped away into a gully. 
At times it followed the older pathways of the Maroons and the enslaved, and at others it crossed and deviated from them. Bordered by John Crow bushes, paths vanished into the forest, only to return to sight at a higher elevation. I travelled in a car. Lily Carby, like other planters and overseers, would have ridden horses up these paths. Whatever could not be transported by river, donkeys carried between the coast and the plantations. The enslaved, also beasts of burden, climbed up and down on foot. I thought about the people who had carved these tracks into the hillsides with their feet. Those who brushed thick carpets of ferns as they shambled, shackled together in a coffle driven from port to plantation. I wondered what they had carried in their arms, in their memories, in their souls. How little and how much the landscape had changed since then. Colonizers wrought drastic transformations in the biogeography of Jamaica at all elevations, harnessing the bodies, energies and skills of enslaved and indentured labor to clear and cut, plant and harvest. Sugar and coffee plantations were designed so that the enslaved would be under constant surveillance while they labored. But within the moss forest of the Blue Mountains, among tree ferns, yucca, Jamaican bamboo, soapwood, under bromeliads and other epiphytes, the colonized maintained and preserved roots where they were out of sight. Paths that led to and from their provision grounds, tracks trodden quietly at night to attack the Spanish and the British settlers. Trails between states used to visit kin or gather at secret meeting places. Routes of escape on which to run. When he was garrisoned in Port Antonio, Lily would have met overseers or bookkeepers working on the estates of George Harrison Cousins, who owned two sugar and rum plantations above the army barracks on the coast and in the hills. Now, white men who worked on plantations for the first time were employed as bookkeepers, but their job was not keeping the accounts but roaming the fields and works, managing and disciplining black bodies under the direction of an overseer, the man who managed the estates and reported directly to the owner. While the Revolutionary War raged, the Elysium and Shrewsbury estates belonging to George Cousins were the sites of Lily's seasoning. His period of adjustment and acculturation among hundreds of the enslaved. Here he learnt to become a white man in a British colony. Here he came to realise that as a white man he could exercise power with impunity. Here he raped and punished and tormented. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hazel. It's I I don't know how to follow. Um thank you thank you for this book. Thank you for your reading um and and for your your friendship. I'm going to read um first from my introduction, uh, Curiosities, and then I'll skip forward a bit and um, read from the middle of the book. And then I think I'll go right to the last, almost the last page. 
Dear Science and Other Stories is a collection of ideas I've been gathering since about 2004. The project began as a curiosity. I was originally interested in how race is attended to in feminist and science, feminist science and technology studies, and how black feminists and black scholars work through the thorny racial privileges and biases that animate this field. My contribution to this conversation was to center black creatives, poets, musicians, and visual artists, and think through how they attend to science in their work. I sat with June, Jor June Jordan's kerosene, iridation, and phosphorescence. I sat with, these, with the kerosene, iridation, and phosphorescence not to discount scientific racism, and biological determinism, but to ask questions about how black worlds are not always wholly defined by scientific racism and biological determinism. I wanted to draw attention to how black creatives work with scientific concepts in innovative and humanizing ways. Attentive to racism, yes, but not understanding scientific racism as the only way to define black life. This was complemented by my ongoing research on Sylvia Winter, in particular her demonic mo model, which she discusses in her essay, Beyond Miranda's Meanings, and the concepts of autopoiesis and science of the word, which she takes up in a number of her essays. The demonic model taken from physics is used by Winter to think about the intellectual and conceptual ground through which Caribbean women recalibrate the meaning of humanity. Autopoiesis is a term developed by the biologists Maturana and Varela, and it's used by Winter to show that we invest in our present normative mode of existence in order to keep the living system, our environmental and existential world, as is. This is a recursive logic. It depicts our present, our present ecocidal and genocidal world as normal and unalterable. And it is our work to notice this logic and to breach it. Winter's extension of Cesar's science of the word speaks to interdisciplinarity, dislodging our biocentric system of knowledge, and showing that the natural sciences, the humanities, and the social sciences are, when thought together, generative sites of inquiry. In using concepts such as these, scientific terms that are not cast as purely and objectively scientific, yet retain within them traces of the hard sciences, Winter theorizes race outside raciology and positions blackness and black studies as an analytics of invention. My curiosity led me to think about the humanizing work black creatives illuminate in their scientifically creative and creatively scientific after art worlds, while also drawing attention to the disruptive work that black feminists and black scholars do. I share Dear Science not as a project that describes science, particularly black science, through or as scientific racism, but as a study of how we come to know black life through asymmetrically connected knowledge systems. Science is present, it's tied to the curiosities noted, but it is restless and uncomfortably situated and multifarious rather than definitive and downward pressing. Dear Science is a book about black livingness and ways of knowing. The shift I made from studying science to studying ways of knowing has allowed me to work out where and how black thinkers imagine and practice liberation as they are weighed down by what I can only describe as biocentrically induced accumulation by dispossession. The weight is important here because it single signals not simply a monumental system of knowledge that is fueled by colonial and plantocratic logics, but the weight that bears down on all Black people inside and outside the academy and puts pressure on their physiological and psychic and political well-being. Dear Science takes into account how Black intellectual life is tied to corporeal and affective labor flesh and brains and blood and bones, hearts, souls, by noticing the physiological work of black liberation. These labors are, however, impossible to track and capture with precision. In noticing the physiological work of black liberation, I'm asking for a mode of recognition that does not itemize or commodify black liberation and black embodied knowledge. Indeed, tracking down, so quantifying or endlessly describing um, black corporeal and affective and physiological labor belies the kinds of black studies the stories in Dear Science tell. For this reason, 
affective, physiological, corporeal, intellectual labor within the text is momentary and somewhat erratic. I imperfectly draw attention to how seeking liberation and reinventing the terms of black life outside normatively negative conceptions of blackness is onerous, joyful, and difficult, yet unmeasured and measurable. My heart makes my my heart makes my head swim. In the book, I share a series of interdisciplinary stories that are indebted to anti-colonial thought and black studies. Dear Science argues that black people have always used interdisciplinary methodologies to explain, explore, and story the world because thinking and writing and imagining across a range of texts, disciplines, histories, and genres unsettles suffocating and dismal and insular racial logics. By employing interdisciplinary methodologies and living interdisciplinary worlds, Black people bring together various sources and texts and narratives to challenge racism. Or Black people bring together various sources and texts and narratives not to capture something or someone, but to question the analytical work of capturing and the desire to capture something or someone. Black methodologies is a way of living and it's an analytical frame. It is curious and sustained by wonder and the desire to know. This is a method that demands openness and is unsatisfied with questions that result in descriptive data-induced answers. Black studies and anti-colonial thought offer methodological practices wherein we read, live, hear, groove, write, create across a range of temporalities, places, texts, and ideas that build on existing liberatory practices and pursue ways of living in a world that are uncomfortably generous and provisional and practical and as well imprecise and unrealized. The method is rigorous and wonder is study. Curiosity is intent attentive. Black method is therefore not continuously and absolutely undisciplined. It is precise, detailed, coded, long and forever. The practice of bringing together multiple texts, stories, songs and places involves the difficult work of thinking and learning across many sites and thus coming to know generously varying and shifting worlds and ideas. Sometimes this is awful because we are gathering dense texts and uncomfortable ideas that wear us out. Sometimes this is awful because we are aware we cannot know for, uh, forever, yet we are committed to the everlasting effort of figuring out how we might together fashion liberation. We are also always running out of time. The rigor is animated by diasporic literacy, Veve Clark's wonderfully useful reading practice that investigates and shows how we already do or can illuminate and connect existing and emerging diasporic codes, tempos, stories, narratives, and themes. Clark shows how diasporic literacy is structured through recognized references sharing a wealth of connotations. She theorizes Malhaya Jackson, food furnishing, laughter as grammars, figures and practices that are written into creative and intellectual texts as prompts. These literacies function to expand this text outside of itself. The prompt opens a door. Malhaya Jackson and laughter are not endlessly explained and unpacked. Instead, they cue what does not need explanation, but requires imagination and memory and study. Diasporic literacy signals ways of being and ways of living, memories, imaginations, and that we all know and share in order to collectively struggle against suffocating racial logics, like sorrow songs, like freedom dreams, like erotic, like flying cheekbones. I'm just gonna jump to the middle of the book. Um, and this is from, um, the story, the smallest cell remembers a sound. If we are committed to anti-colonial thought, our starting point must be one of disobedient relationality that always questions and thus is not beholden to normative academic logics. This means our method making may not necessarily take us where we want to go, but it will take us as Glissant writes to an unknown that doesn't terrify. 
doing anti-colonial work in the academy and talking about race in relation to discipline and interdiscipline can be enriched by thinking across texts and places. If, as I suggest throughout the book, the discipline of thought stabilizes and restricts the category of race, we must recognize that the project of academically attending to race cannot always bear black life. Indeed, the work of discipline so neatly and so quietly tied to the biocentric infrastructures of empire forbids a genre of blackness that is not solely and absolutely defined by and through abjection, subjection, and objectification. The project of making discipline overwhelmingly only, give, overwhelmingly only gives us two options for the study of black people, to describe racism and to resist racism. These options rarely have any noise or curiosity or questions about black life interrupting them. Discipline, even identity discipline, cannot adequately attend to blackness precisely because black life is absent from the disciplinary question. Or discipline describes black death and degradation as legitimate scholarly findings. Method making, is the enactment of black life and bursts through disciplined abjection. Method making is relation. And I'm just going to read a quote from Edward Glissant. He writes, we are barely beginning to conceive of this immense friction. The more it works in favor of an oppressive order, the more it calls for disorder as well. The more it produces exclusion, the more it generates attraction. It standardizes. But at every node of relation, we find calluses of resistance. Relation is learning more and more to go beyond judgments into the unexpected dark of art's upsurgings. Its beauty springs from the stable and the unstable, from the deviance, from the deviance of many particular po poetics and the clairvoyance of a relational poetics. The more things it standardizes into a state of lethargy, the more rebellious consciousness it arouses. That's the end of his quote. Method making acknowledges and despises and critiques degradation without sourcing it as the only way to know black people. Method making knows that black people know. We know more than object, objecthood and we know more than the objecthood that is projected upon us. We are not abject, we know more, we know ourselves. And I'm just going to skip right to the very end of my, I'm almost finished here, the end of the book. And this is um, from, I entered the lists. And it's the very last page of that story. History has its dimension of the unexplorable at the edge of which we wander, our eyes wide open. They burned the pages. They signed the papers. She signed the paper. I better get some sleep. Is it possible to reduce our chronology to a basic skeleton of facts in any combination? Saturday, Saturday, July 19th, 2025. Time drags. My name is 111, five haunted years. And I'll end there. Oh, that was just extraordinary, Catherine. I don't, I don't know if you, no, what an important book you have written. I mean, it's just quite incredible. I mean, just, you know, just just, just, just look at my book. Every page, I don't know if you can see, every page is just, you know, there's, there's little stars and there's lines and there's, you know, <laughs> yesing. And, you know, when you talk about um, black livingness, it's such, it's such an extraordinary book to read. And it, one of the things I really love is because it fills me with, energy mm. to do something mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. change and and I want I wanted to ask you about um you know the terms like curiosity and wonder which you mm -hmm. engender in the reader and and the book performs curiosity and, and wonder and the more I've thought about this I was thinking you've you've taken on that whole history of the sort of um you know cabinets of curios curiosities mm -hmm. um that whole way to organize knowledge that actually precedes museums that whole burden of the history of fixing us as objects 
in like natural history museums or whatever. But you've reclaimed that language. You've made mm -hmm. that language work for you. And instead of these sort of cabinet of curiosities, we have these remarkable stories, um, mm -hmm. which in fact we can read, you encourage us to read in any order. And mm -hmm. I must admit, you're urging us to be, you know, so disruptive all the time and to breach these things. But the first time I read the book, you know, I did it in order. Okay. <laughs> You know, because so much of my academic training like that. <clears throat> but then I thought, no, I want to take up your challenge. And, I, mm. and, I, and I've read it in all sorts of different ways and gone back and sort of, you know, reassembled it or whatever. So you really have engendered incredible curiosity um, and wonder. And I wonder if you could just just talk about that, how how those ideas and, and, and why that language sort of claim to you, because it's so powerful, mm -hmm. so powerful. Yeah, and thank you for your kind words about, about the book. So I, I, I'm, I'm happy I didn't pass out when you were talking, because I'm so delighted that you liked the book. Um, and Loved it. Loved I, it. Yeah, loved it. And I, I'm just so and and I, I'll tell you a little bit about this. And then I want to like, tell you about a curiosity I have of your book. Um, and what what cur how curious how I read your book um, as a curious person. Um, but I so Sylvia Winter has this essay called But What Does Wonder Do? And I talk about that a little bit in Devonic Grounds. And I found it so useful for thinking about what wonder and what curiosity does to those objects that were are supposed to be static and how it kind of explodes because and I don't think we can track wonder it's almost a delightful enthusiasm um and even if it's sad or or terrible it kind of it opens things up um and there's an endlessness to it and I think that's important and I and and I think it's important for any academic study, particularly when we're told to delimit how we organize our thoughts. I read all books in order to, <laughs> you know, I love, I, I love boxes, I love lists, but I, I also want to see what we can do with that, with those, with those lists. Um, and I think that's what Black Studies have, has taught us, and that's what Black Feminine feminism has taught us is that the 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 categorization um cannot cannot hold the brilliance of black life and black livingness it just can't um and and so that's that that's why I love thinking about curiosity and thinking about wonder, um, that openness. But it's always tethered to the categorization, and I and I and I I can't I can't let that go. Like I can't sort of just float in otherwiseness. Um, I think that I, I but. I guess that's what the creative text is for, to provide a bit of a floatingness, <laughs> floatiness to the to the to the categorization. The creative text kind of allows us to imagine outside of that. Um, but then we kind of have to come we come back. Um, and so with with this book, which I have, and mine is all marked up too, which is your <laughs> book, um, which it's, I, you know, it's hard for me to not weep a little when I read this book because it's, it's, I can't, I just, I don't know what to do with the labor that went into this. And I try to describe that a little bit in Dear Science um, about what's, what does it mean to write a book like this? What, what kind of intellectual energy does it take? And why am I asking that question? Why do I need to know? you know, how monumental the, like the details, I just, so can I read a little, my favorite mm -hmm. passage to yeah, you? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not going to know what it is because I have no idea. Okay. I'm not, okay, so it's on, in this version, it's on page 164 and I, I'll try not to read it all. 
For Rebecca, the laundering of garments, sheets, towels, and blankets was accomplished by unassisted muscle power. It was as arduous and demanding as the work of a mason's laborer. Laundresses were hired as much for their brute strength as for their expertise. Laundry had to be sorted and heavy loads lifted, carried to and from and in and out of tubs to be soaked or boiled, soaked or boiled, scrubbed, blued, starched, and rinsed. Agitating water in tubs for heavily soiled items or for blankets, quilts, and sheets was backbreaking work. Laundry was rotated by hand using a wooden dolly, which resembled a milking stool at the end of a long stick with two handles mounted crosswise at the top, or dolly pegs resembling a toilet plunger with a perforated metal at the base. And then I'm just going to skip to the next page. Finally, everything had to be folded and there's more instructions. I have here in my side notes, Hazel Carby's instructions, exclamation point. <laughs> Finally, everything had to be folded and packed for delivery. In a commercial laundry, Rebecca would have specialized either in the cleaning or ironing process. Working in a private residence, she would have done it all and have hauled tubs of water on and off sources of heat. In both situations, the pattern of the week was the same. The collection, labeling, sorting, and cleaning of the wash began at dawn on Mondays. The work of ironing started toward the middle of the week and continued into the weekend. Rebecca would have been constantly exhausted. I, 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 I just, I'm speechless. I, you know, it's beautifully written, but it's, this is, it shows how it, it, the storytelling is imbued with this labor that is, you is a, is imaginable. It's almost tangible. Um, the lists, the heaviness. Um, can I ask you about? And this is not the only place this occurs in in the book. Even though it's my favorite passage, <laughs> um, can you talk a bit about your methodology and your the way you write? Um, it's not, uh, it's not a history. <clears throat> so can you talk a little bit about? Yeah, so, <clears throat> I mean, you, you warn us very effectively of the, of the danger of, you know, of, of data, of um, information that appears to be, well, of information that is basically um, flat. It can't really necessarily tell us what we want to know. So, for example, you know, one example of this would be the slave register. There's all sorts of data there, and there's lists, and there's names. Um, another sort was is censuses. So I really had to think long and hard about translating what appeared to be a sufficiency of information, Rebecca, in a census, and the word laundress. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she lived in Bath. But the history of, you know, the history of women, the history of us as, as Black people doesn't have what you call the livingness. That's what I wanted to do. I mm -hmm. wanted to bring the livingness um, into the text. And in some ways, I found I was more of a historian than I thought I was and that I was spending all this time in the archives. But when you say it's difficult, it was difficult because, you know, on the one hand in the archives, it's it's the it's the rich and the famous that have left all sorts of information that you can find out. The people who've left, you know, who have had property. Mm -hmm. How can you reconstruct the livingness? Um, how can you re how can you reinvigorate that? How can you encourage what you would call 
curiosity and wonder in the mm -hmm. reader about these lives <clears throat> that on a piece of paper is just that's supposed to be sufficient, you know, mm -hmm. lordless, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in incredibly poor. I mean, right. and then, so a lot, a lot of the time in the book, in a lot of different spaces, I think very seriously about the question of the laboring body and it's it's you know it's usually the female laboring body and what that means for livingness but i also spend mm -hmm. an awful lot of time in terms of you know and it's it's all it's all your earlier work too you know demonic grounds and thinking about space and place um <clears throat> and really bringing livingness into that so you know, staring at, um, you taught me a lot about thinking about geography um, mm -hmm. in much more complex ways. So, you know, looking at maps and all the rest of it and mm -hmm. realizing that Rebecca lived in this incredibly, this tiny alleyway. Yeah. And then if you look at insurance maps, you can find what all the other buildings were. So I knew that at the end of her road, there was a slaughterhouse. Yeah. And when I actually looked at the area, you know, where the poor live, where the enslaved live, if you think very carefully about the way in which mapping, conventional mapping has actually flattened livingness right out of it, how can mm. you sort of reintroduce that? And mm -hmm. so I spent a lot of time wondering <laughs> and it was, it was, it was the curiosity um, and curiosity often about what was not being said. Yeah. But I also, you know, really follow you because, you know, I do profoundly believe that we have to be extremely disruptive Mm -hmm, we have mm -hmm. to reach these 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 absences mm -hmm. um and we have to through our curiosity and our wonder use whatever other sources we can and our creative imagination yeah because one of the most <coughs> effective passages and descriptions i've ever read about a slaughterhouse and what it was like is actually in a michael on Duchy novel Right. You know, so and 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 paintings and art mm -hmm. and and that whole world, um, if you engage, you know, if that whole world completely transforms things like censuses and mm -hmm. data collections and 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 objecthood. So I learned all that from you. Wow. <laughs> so I think. Well, because you know, so you know, you you, you emphasise the collective that we mm -hmm. all our work is collective. Yeah, wow. and thinking. I mean, there's a there's the the kinds of the the geographies that you talk about in this in in your book. You do what I you know you the you the connections you make between, for example, a street and the the affective experience of the street and then the and then you the written the way that you write up the street like the connections that you make and how you attend to geography are so careful that you're giving us an interdisciplinary or uh, an interdisciplinary mapping of what what would normally be a two on a two two dimensional space, but it's also exceeding what you actually write because the reader has to respond to it. Um, and so, to give an example of the kitchen and what you do with the kitchen, which I love because you demystify the black feminist kitchen actually in many ways which is yay right because the kitchen's not fun <laughs> for some no. people <laughs> absolutely um, not, not yeah, magical and, at all 
not magical. And so I think that that's another kind of space that gets a geography that gets propped up in a particular kind of way um, that, and then it gets propped up in a, a particular kind of way through a, a theoretical trajectory and it needs to be unsettled, right? And I think that that's, the, that's what you're doing with, with space and place. And you can think about that, how you mesh ecology with the map, with the story, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I think <clears throat> you're much braver than me <laughs> in terms of, of, of tackling the question of, of science. And I really, I really like how you, how you do that. I mean, I tried um, a little bit when I was thinking about the question of pollution mm -hmm. and the effect on the body. But can you talk about? I mean, you know, this, this is this is a letter, dear science, right? But on <laughs> the other hand, what what science is in your book? Mm -hmm. is not what we have been taught to think it is. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? So when you talk about unsettling, when you talk about breaching, you breach the distance mm -hmm. between what we think science is and, and the humanities. You're always searching for a new humanism. But you, mm -hmm. you make us believe that it's possible that this rethinking of science can be part of that. Yeah. Not, not not it not not its opposite, and that we must mm -hmm. we must think about that seriously. Can you talk about that? I can. Yeah. I mean, I think I I I mean part of the part of the book, it, it it's hopeful. It's hopeful. Um, it is as you you know gestured to. It it is about like it is a Fanonian project. It's a winter project. It's about thinking about the, a new science of human being or human being as praxis, um, new humanism, those types of things. And part of that is to take seriously the physiological underpinnings of our humanity. And so that is a science. We are biological beings. Um, and so how do we attend to biology without Re returning to the old story of um, uh, scientific racism and Darwinism. Um, how do we think about creative works as scientific works, like Cesar kind of asks us to? There are a number of ways I think that we can frame science not as just the bad guy. That doesn't mean it's not problematic it is but I think we know that right I think a lot of black people know that and so I'm more interested in what they're doing um, with scientific concepts and scientific ideas um, and how they're thinking about science as liberatory uh, but part of the book is also about failure the algorithm chapter is a is is a is about not being able to understand computer science and being bold enough to think that I could, <laughs> you know, um, and, 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 and kind of, yeah, and kind of, to me, that was a bit rude as well to, to think that I could all of a sudden start reading physics and, and computer science books and be able to master a discipline that I have no background training in. Part of it, part of it, for part of the the journey for me has been to recognize that failure, know the limitations, know that there are limitations to interdisciplinary thought and radical interdisciplinary thought, but also walk across the hallway or across the campus and look for radical mathematicians and look for radical computer scientists who are committed to rebellion, committed to liberation, who are you know. Uh, who are, it, you know, reading black studies because they are, and I think that was the that was one of the exciting things about the one of the exciting outcomes of this project was have a conversation with a computer programmer, um, try and figure out how they how they what they imagine emancipation is or what they imagine liberation is. What do they do? Are they into abolition? 
if they what does it look like on a computer on the back end and things like that mm -hmm. so those are sort of some of the things that i've been thinking about but i do think it's like a failure possibility kind of thing that i've that i'm i'm treading on like it's not resolved um we have to keep keep going keep but i think asking I think, questions i think that's actually really important <coughs> that we do actually face the way we can't resolve things i certainly mm -hmm. could not resolve everything um in my book and i i must admit i read i started the chapter on algorithms with trepidation <coughs> mm -hmm. frankly on the one hand like you i find it extremely um difficult to understand exactly what all the implications are although i also know that they're being used in incredibly dangerous ways mm -hmm. uh, but the raciology that we refuse to be determined by that we undermine all the time is coming back in through the back door through algorithms i know i know that and i feel as if i have to tackle it but what i think is so remarkable about your book is that you take us through all those stages of questioning and we understand the importance of trying to come to terms with this even though in a way we're being we're being invited to be part of the struggle that we mm -hmm. know we can't necessarily resolve you know i mean also partly because of our our training and yeah. it, and it gets back to the profound questions you ask about interdisciplinarity, which are not, you know, interdisciplinarity can become this very superficial thing these days. Everyone's mm -hmm. supposed to be doing it, but you ask really profound questions about it, and mm -hmm. and the and the danger of the fixity of of the disciplines. But what mm -hmm. I really like about that is your being extremely open about the, what the consequences are of these disciplines and these fixities. Yeah. And it's also our training, which means I can't feel confident with algorithms or I am terrified, right. but you give me the, you give me the courage to pursue the questioning. And mm -hmm. that I think is, is really, really important because I think we have to be prepared in these projects, these disruptive projects, these projects where we're trying to undermine so much of the edifices of, of education, of the academy, of disciplining and disciplining mm -hmm. our bodies, but not pretending that we've resolved that. Because in a way, that's the problem with disciplines. Yeah. You know, they, 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 they appear as closed shops. They have all the answers. And mm -hmm. so it's actually, I think it's very important that you, you, you pose this project of liberation as absolutely the struggle. We, mm -hmm. haven't, got, we haven't got there yet. Mm -hmm. But you're giving mm -hmm. us, you know, ammunition <laughs> and also the confidence to, to continue to be this very disruptive. Mm -hmm. Which is the only yeah. way to be. And I wonder, I, yeah, I wonder a lot about, or I, I think a lot about how answers, how, how particular answers demand that we replicate the existing system. And I've thought about that since I was a graduate student, you know, and I think that I, I, it just, it's sort of so, it just bears down on you that you know that if you say that black people are oppressed, you'll get funding, <laughs> you know, you'll get a, a particular type of grant. Um, and it, and it's so restrictive. Um, and it's becomes, it's an, it becomes so normal. Um, and it's so deeply concerning to me. It's just so, you know, um, and, and uh, yeah, so I just, it's just something that kind of, that's always haunted me is the answer that can't be the answer. We can't have the answer to this mm -hmm. um, at this moment. Um, and it returns us to the fixity in the, as objects in the, you know, in the natural history museums or whatever. And, you know, the question of trauma. And I mean, as you say, this work, 
this work is not without pain <laughs> and mm -hmm. sadness <clears throat> in terms mm -hmm. of, of doing it. I mean, there were many times in doing this work um, when I cried and I had to walk away from the computer, I had to walk away from the slave register um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or whatever. But um, it's... The curiosity, yes, indeed, keeps you going, but also this sort of sense, extraordinary sense of commitment. Yeah. That you demand um, yeah. of us. Um, because of the sort of extraordinary importance um, of the work, but also because, you know, it's, it's also acts of refusal. We mm. cannot... We cannot afford to be locked in to those. I want because I want to use the word identities. I mean, one of the yeah. words, one of the things in the book that I try and do is actually not think about identities as fixed, mm -hmm. but to question all the time. And and I I tend to place replace the word you know like becoming. Yeah, becoming. But what are you know? What what are, at different moments in history, what is shaping people, um, and how are they responding to it? And how how do they become to think think of themselves as white? It doesn't happen mm. when they're born, right? It happens yeah. under certain circumstances, and then they act on it. But it's it but it's a process, mm -hmm. and 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 that that is so present, um, you know, in your work. And I I worry when students sometimes think that oh they found their identity and it's fixed and that's the answer to everything mm -hmm. that's that's mm -hmm. the beginning of questioning yeah of, yeah of the becoming right yeah 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 take him in becoming you know a white supremacist um yeah so <clears throat> yeah i i mean i think it i think one of the as you said at the beginning of your reading um your book thinks about how people are inserted into empire and how empire is kind of this nest of becomingness i guess or you know in different ways that different ways that that i mean i it, it's it's i mean one of my big questions i guess one of my questions for you would be like how so as as people are inserted into empire and empire is the nest through which we all differentially become and that shifts over time and space can you talk a little bit about the decisions to um to so carefully write race in this way where it's not just you're not, you don't recategorize whiteness and blackness. You refute, you do this in all of your work. Like you, it's so brilliant the way that you do this. So, but you could so easily, you could kind of say like, here's the washerwoman, a white woman, you know what I mean? Here's a black slave. And you could actually write a particular kind of history, but there's the, the humanizing work that you're doing through writing these stories re refuses that. Can you talk a bit about that? about how race gets taken, how race is like a flexible category that is nested within an empire that's demanding something else? I mean, part of the word, part of it is what you said, stories. I mean, part of it actually is in being scrupulous about the narration and that, that these, these existences are narrated to people it's part mm -hmm. of um the story of i mean of empire but you know in in the sort of context in the uk so empire was over there outside right empire was out the colonies away a distance some other place with mm -hmm. strange beings so one of one of the first steps was actually to say no, this is actually very active. Yeah. Empire has to constantly activate and inscribe its subjects internally and externally. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 work. It's it's part of the labor of empire, you know? Mm -hmm. Whether <clears throat> that 
work is happening through a pen. You know, the beautiful script, yes. which is yes. inscribing yes. and penning an enslaved being yes. um, as non-human on a, on a register. You know, it's, it's, it's all those account books. It's all those accounting practices um, which inscribe. And people have to, you know, people are working at, at this. But it's also um, how... You know, in a in a in a tiny little hamlet, um, not anywhere near a sort of metropolitan area. What is it that someone can can encounter to imagine that they even have a relation to to empire? You mm. know, and I mean, sometimes it's a, it seems perhaps. I don't know, perhaps a little too scrupulous or something. But you know, I. I I look at cigarette cards, you know, yeah, um, yeah. That, that children have, and yeah, um, and these, um, you know, shop shop windows where you can actually see, you know, these these beings who mm. were, were, if you were British, you owned the you owned them, right? Because mm. you owned the colonies, you owned yeah. the people in it. Even though you couldn't actually afford anything in that shop, you could still look through the window. You could still get, you know, um, those pictures on the biscuit tins, which mm. were given all your, all all the images that you're surrounded by in in school. And there's, so, I had to. I found this. Um, these lantern slideshows were really important. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the I 19th, love that part. From early 20th century. So mm -hmm. I imagine going with my grandmother into a lantern slideshow in Bristol. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually, you know, that moment where it's trying to encourage people to be tourists, to actually open up a tourist trade with Jamaica. But lantern mm -hmm. slideshows weren't just for the rich, they were... I you know, they were a form of entertainment that was free and lots of poor people could could go. But what did you learn? You know, mm -hmm. looking, at, mm -hmm. looking at these images, mm -hmm. you learn as a poor person that you sort of, you owned this colony. Yeah. Right? There was a way in which you were being inscribed into empire in all sorts of complex ways. Yeah. Um, so it, it's always that it's always that becoming it isn't a closure because yeah. it's never totally it's never totally finished mm -hmm. because you also have to deal with moments like i don't know well, well during the war i mean there's all these there's all these people from colonies quote unquote all over the world who came they were in british uniforms and they fought mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and then when they went, how did they then suddenly become immigrants? How did they then become un-British? They were all British. How did they become un-British? What was mm -hmm. going on, you know, in in that teacher's mind? Yeah. Said, no. Yeah. When you actually deny that history, that is work that's 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 being done. And so, yeah. you know, you have to look sort of very carefully at the different at the different moments and and how that is how that is being achieved mm -hmm. and it, it feels like a series of pedagogies or something like a series or like there's there's lessons there's lessons on how to become and you kind of take like the land like like the teacher like the inscriptions like there's just so many layers of what lessons or there's so many lessons layered into the in there when I was talking about the instructions of the laundry, like there's just like these different ways that you become um, that are all interconnected to each other. So for me, the penmanship is quietly linked to the laundry list, to the what you do. There are just different iterations or different mm -hmm. repetitions. I guess it would be repetition that I'm looking for where you know, you go, you go to the lantern slides, you know what I mean? There's um, different performances and rehearsals. 
Yeah, because I actually I found the, the script of that lantern and slideshow in the Cambridge Library, so I was able to sort of mm -hmm. do you think amazing. Do you think anyone has questions for us? Or <laughs> there's no one <laughs> there's no questions in the question oh, box. Okay. okay, that's good. So, so we're we're okay, but we're at 846. So I wonder, should we ask ER to come back, Hazel? Yeah, that would be great. Um, thank you both so much for this wonderful reading and conversation. Um, I, I think folks at home have just gotten a lovely education tonight. Um, it's very generous. So um, I want to overwhelmed them. And, and no, <laughs> I don't know, maybe, but in a nice way, I think. Um, so for everybody watching at home, you can click this teal button at the bottom center of your screen, and that will take you to the page where you can buy both of these books that you just heard snippets of. Um, and I, I trust that you will want to buy both of them. Um, thank you so much to the Auburn Avenue Research Library and particularly to Morris Gardner, who has dropped incredible resources throughout. So go back. Um, these This will just stay up. You can revisit all of these links. So these are all publicly available, um, free, free scholarly resources. So if you want to deepen, you know, some of the references you heard tonight, go check those out because um, you got you got a lot of uh, content here tonight. Many rabbit holes to go down, many references. So if you heard names that you'd never heard before, go check those out. Um, in, in your local library or in the Auburn Avenue Research Library's um, online resources. And finally, um, we will be adding captions to this event and putting it up on our YouTube channel, which is just YouTube backslash Kara Circle. So be on the lookout for that and please share that. Um, and again, thank you both so much for being with us virtually. Um, we would love to host you in person sometime, but we're, we're thrilled to get to do this. Um, it really allows for us to get to host many more people than we might otherwise get to celebrate. So I hope that you both stay safe and well. Um, thank and you for being such a wonderful host. Oh. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah. It's my pleasure. <laughs> um, well, yeah. take care and thank you. Thank, thank you, Hazel. You. Night, night, Catherine. Good night.